you know, self-confidence and, um, and uh, excitement around food. Um, and then I also like the complexities of just trying to bring new things to life. You know, you know, why, why can't a non, why can't a nonprofit work with a school board to, to pull off a, you know, a, a social brand enterprise that allows, you know, business learning opportunities for, for youth um, and helps support the teachers uh, in different ways at that school. I love, um, yeah, and, and likewise with our Lunch Lab program, incredibly innovative. There is a conversation brewing across Canada right now about the fact that Canada is the only G7 country that does not have a nationally supported universal school meal program. Uh, which is astounding. Um, and so we have done a lot of work here provincially with the BC chapter for the healthy, the Coalition for Healthy School Food um, um, around and working with our partners. So I love the complexity um, that that brings and working on, you know, bringing, uh, you know, having these higher, higher order aspirations that then you can involve the, you know, the five-year-olds on the farm in, in, in understanding uh, also what it means to, uh, how great it is to just like pick up a kohlrabi and, and eat it right from the garden. <laughs> do, do any stories uh, come to mind? Any experiences that you can share? Yeah, I think for, I, there's so many, so many. Um, you know, I think when I say that uh, the farms and the food are, and the programming are just an, a means to really open the doors for kids and youth to develop their own leadership skills, their sense of self-confidence, um, our soil youth leadership program, the stories are very profound about how transformational having um, opportunities to, um, to, to feel like they belong and, and to really um, uh, to have um, a place, a métier where they can dig mm -hmm. in and feel confident. Um, we are really focused on working with, um, uh, we work closely with youth and family workers and with um, different resource teachers. So um, we get a great diversity of, um, of youth that enter that program. And, um, you know, these are youth that don't necessarily have access to the regular type of programming. And we bring them together in these like, in these beautiful cohorts where they, they, um, they truly feel a sense of supported community belonging. Um, yeah. So I, sorry, that's it. <laughs> no, it's a, it's a, no, I, I, you know, your smile gives you, gives you away. Yeah. Um, it's uh, <laughs> it's work that you're passionate about and you enjoy. Do you think that COVID-19 will change the way we consider our food choices? We've been talking about that quite a bit on our team. It's fascinating to see what this um, pandemic has really, you know, illuminated in some of our, in some of our systems and our food systems with, um, uh, you know, with just little things like, all the cheese and butter that are available when restaurants are closed. <laughs> um, and, you know, it's kind of, I think it's making everyone kind of stop, pause a little bit and think um, about a bit more deeply about where our food comes from and our supplies chains. Um, there has been in British Columbia such a great momentum um, in support of local food uh, across the sectors. But I do think this is just being once again another um, a motivator to uh, continue to to make sure that we have a thriving agriculture sector, but also a secondary, you know, food processing sector here in British Columbia. And that, um, um, yeah, I think it's exposed some of our vulnerabilities. So I think people are definitely paying a little bit more attention and and looking to um, see how we can build a more resilient food system. I probably have two questions, and I'll put them together. Uh, where where do you see uh, fresh roots going post COVID nineteen? But as the uh, executive director, how do you navigate the organization to that point? I mean, for fresh roots, we're really grateful that we're you know as an agriculture based organization, we're deemed an essential service. So we, um, and then with our programming, I. I think it's it's just it's kind of those creative restraints about um, that have you know I think we're going to be forced to just look at um, okay here's the situation 
how can we adapt but still stay connected and offer learning opportunities and, and community engagement opportunities for kids and and families um so i don't i i don't necessarily think that uh, it will have a a, you know, have a profound impact on on how we operate. I think we're we're kind of um, you know going as we normally do, and just looking at ways to to extra support, like with our our lunch lab chefs for families program. Um, you know, but one example, I think we're just it, what it really has done. I think more than anything has given us a different type of opportunity to uh, deepen the relationships and the way we work with our partners, including the school districts um, and our our good partners over at the school boards, um, and and community partners like the Italian Cultural Center. So I'm curious to see what comes out of just you know when you've mm-hmm. when you've gone a, and worked a bit more deeply and 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 closely together with partners. Uh, it changes. It shifts the opportunities and the possibilities. So I'm excited about that. I think we've all learned to work together under really hard circumstances and are doing a great job. Um, so I'm really, I'm, I'm excited to see what those uh, sort of deepening of community relationships amongst organizations and partners will have. There's an old saying that adversity brings out the best and worst in people. It sounds like you're seeing the best. Oh, just, just amazing. I mean, um, with our partners, Growing Chefs, we've literally smushed two teams together that don't normally work together, you know, and we can't really gather to meet. So it's all on Zoom. And, um, you know, we have to, we really, and then bringing in third partner, third party partners from all over the city, um, with just such an outpouring of product donations and support in different ways. Um, it's truly amazing. I really do think, um, I'm I'm so proud of the work that so many people are doing in this in the city in our community. It's very touching. So what keeps you up at night? I mean, I I I have a smile on my face when I talk about the programs that we're able to offer and the work we're able to do. And the truth is is that there are a lot of people struggling right now. Yeah. And there are a lot of small business owners and a lot of nonprofits that aren't in the same position where they're able to continue doing the work that are in real trouble. Um, and so, uh, arts organizations, I come from, you know, the arts sector in a previous, previous hats I've worn, um, and I worry about them. Um, and I worry about the families that, um, that might need to go back to work, but have no, have no schools to send their kids or no childcare or can't afford it. You know, and the small business, I've, I know tons of friends that are just on pins and needles knowing if they're going to be able to stay open or not. So, we're, yeah, there's a lot of good happening, but we're definitely, um, there's some, there's definite hardship and we're all going to need to figure out ways of supporting each other to, to come out the other side, which is going to take time. What do you think the, uh, the outcome is for the not-for-profit sector? Um, there's 300 not-for-profits just in the downtown east side, 22,000 not-for-profits in British Columbia, and many of them can't do the work. Uh, they haven't been able to morph or transition uh, to do the work that they normally do for their communities. So what happens? You know, I I think that that's I, I'm, one of my pet peeves has always been just being in the nonprofit sector in very different arenas. Um, uh, there's such unique sectors within the nonprofit sector. And I think they either, um, I think what happens next will need to be done taking into consideration very different unique circumstances of the different types of of um, organizations and um um and and service organizations uh, where i think there is an interesting opportunity is uh where uh is to collaborate and come together a uh, where there are pockets there's um for example one of the things that fresh roots was involved in um at the beginning of the pandemic uh, was in sort of taking the lead um, on, on bringing together a group of nonprofits across the city involved in, in feeding um, uh, school age kids. And so we kind of got together as a, as a broader community wide task force and talked about needs and how people were doing and what organizations needed. And I think there's real possibilities there. So I know sometimes um, so I, I'm, I'm curious to know what some of the um, 
you know, the leaders or the, the funders might be able to play the roles they might be able to play in convening some of those kind of industry based or, or sector arena based um, conversations for the, you know, the very unique um, different aspects of nonprofits and, and see what creative ideas could come up with in terms of cost sharing and um, collaborating to, to kind of come out the other end, and sharing resources. So you still sound optimistic. <laughs> I think that's just in my nature. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's in my nature. I think that, you know, um, it's really, for me, it's just sort of the only way you just got to, you got to keep up. The The world has been turning for a lot longer than, than this pandemic and people have, have made it through lots of, lots of things. And so, um, yes, not every day I'm smiling. Um, and some days are more challenging, but, um, I think there, there's always some, some, some inklings of possibility or door opening when even in times of, um, of constraint, restraint and, um, and difficulties. So if people want to help, or if you had a crystal ball, or if you could make a wish, uh, what would you like to see changed or happen? Uh, well, people um, can always, um, you know, support the the work that we're doing right now in the time of the pandemic through our Lunch Lab um, Chefs for Families program. So there's more information so for sort of immediate programming that we're doing to feed families at lunchlab.ca. Um, or just reach out through freshroots.ca to get involved. Um, we do, under normal circumstances, have um, have great volunteer opportunities as well as what we call team builds. So we offer opportunities for businesses, um, corporate, or um, whether organizations or families to also come out and and uh, do projects mm-hmm. on the farm and get their hands dirty. Um, you know, one thing we're actually looking at doing is. Um, uh, is offering a, a bit of a, a new family-based program. So for especially for families who are not feeling comfortable necessarily sending their kids to summer camp or while we're still waiting to for that to be okay, um, seeing if we could have opportunities to have families in their, in their safe family units come out to the farm and engage in outdoor learning experience and then harvest some kale to take home to make salad. That would be a great opportunity and fun. Yeah, we think so too. So stay tuned for that one coming soon. So what haven't we talked about that we should? Well, I could give you a few of the numbers of just sort of our stats of what our impact is sort of annually. If that's of interest. I is. I'm curious. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I always kind of go to the anecdotal, the stories and the, and the narratives, but um, uh, so in terms of the numbers, Fresh Roots farms on over 10 acres of land that we steward uh, on uh, five different sites. Um, annually, we support and engage with over 6,000 kids and youth. Uh, we grow over 15,000 pounds of produce every year. And uh, we serve um, close to 18,000 nutritious meals in through our different programs. Wow. Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah, it's it is amazing when you see the numbers. It's really exciting. Um we've got such a great team. That has to feel really good. Yes, it does. I think um I think as, you know, at all the excitement over people buying seeds and starting gardens at this time um is really says a lot about just um the value of and um and what you can personally get out of just you know, seeing a carrot grow from seed and then and pulling it out. There's so much satisfaction. There's so much connection with them. It makes everyone slow down and really pay attention to, you know, um, you know, uh, your own, your own, I don't, not sure. It's a, it's just such a beautiful way of staying connected with um, the greater ecosystem and the, the things that are larger than us. That and, I think is and really and grounding. With, and with each other. Exactly. Exactly. I really want to thank you for taking time to uh, to talk with us. Again, if people want to find out more, freshroots.ca. Yes, thank you so much. Correct. Yeah, freshroots.ca. And um, don't hesitate to reach out. Uh, we're definitely open to all sorts of conversations, partnerships, and opportunities that people might have ideas for. We've been speaking with Alexa Petulis from the Fresh Roots Urban Farm Society. 
To catch up with Alexa or find out more, just go to 